Christ. The church is a people. The church is not an organization. The church is an organism. When I say come join the church, I ain't talking about joining Omega or Alpha or Kappa or Sigma. I ain't talking about joining Delta or AKA or Zeta or Sigma Gamma Rho. No, you join the lodge. You join the golf club. When I say join the body of Christ, I'm talking about becoming a member of a movement. Somebody ought to help me here. A member of a living, breathing organism. And the only way you have membership is if you agree to be active. Turn to the gospel according to Matthew. God's got us right where he wants us now. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 28. I want to begin with verse number 18. I toiled and I struggled for the last two weeks trying to put together visuals and PowerPoints and such. But for this week, the Lord just didn't give it to me. Normally, he puts graphics in my view. He tells me what he wants things to look like for you all on screen. And for the last two weeks, I had been struggling and praying, trying to find different things to put together. And he, he said, it's not going to be one of those kind of sermons. But there is a word from the Lord. And if you listen, you can take your own notes as the Holy Spirit inspires you. Matthew, Matthew 28, beginning with verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This afternoon, with your prayers and with your energetic participation as the Holy Spirit guides us, I want to use our topic of conversation this morning from the bottom up. On your way to your seat, tell somebody God's going to do it from the bottom up. Amen. From the bottom. I wonder if anybody know about the bottom. God is going to do it from the bottom. A few months ago, some of you may remember a message that I preached entitled The Minority Report. It talked about a season when God was getting ready to move his people into the promised land. But in advance of doing so, the Lord told Moses to send 12 spies to go and scout the land in advance. Many of you remember the report that came back from the majority of those spies. Ten out of the 12 came back with a report that the enemy was too powerful for them to overcome. They said, Moses, I, I know what you say the Lord told you about this land, but we've looked at the land and we have come to the realization that we are like grasshoppers in the sight of our enemies. They said, we are like uh, grasshoppers and they are like giants and there's no way that we can conquer such a powerful enemy. Again, 10 out of the 12. A majority of those that were sent out had a, a negative outlook. But then the Bible declares that 
two brothers named Joshua and Caleb who were of that company of 12. They had a different outlook. They came back with a different opinion and they declared from the minority report that we are more than able with the Lord on our side. We are more than able to take this land and anybody in it. Joshua and Caleb said that if God gave us a promise, if we believe in who God says he is, the minority report says that God not only has the promise, but he also has the power to fight our battle and to help us win. And sure enough, according to the minority report, the children of Israel were victorious against the enemy. And what you and I ought to learn from that story, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the God that you serve, understand God ain't never needed a majority in order to work a miracle. Do I have a witness here? God ain't never needed a whole lot of folk uh, to believe. Uh, all he needs is just a faithful few uh, who can believe the report of the Lord. I know it's scary sometimes when you feel like you're standing by yourself or those that are with you, sometimes they don't stand up as quick or they don't speak as loud as your enemy does, but I'm here to tell you that all God needs uh, is a few people uh, that don't mind believing him by faith. It don't take 5,000. It don't take 500. It don't take 50. It doesn't even take five. Jesus says if two or three Y'all going to help me preach today? I said, if two or three are gathered in my name, I promise to be in your midst. At that point, it doesn't matter who's against you in this world. At that point, it doesn't matter who's decided to walk away from you. Why? Because when Jesus is on your side, it doesn't matter how big your enemy is. The reason why you ought to be shouting on a Sunday afternoon is because the God you serve has a history of stepping up for you showing up for you and showing out on your behalf where are the people that have overcome some odds that was stacked against you I wish I had a witness here where are the folk that know you shouldn't even be here today your neighbor's looking at a miracle right now your neighbor's sitting next to somebody who would not be here if it were not for the Lord who was on your side. I'm here to talk to the people who can be honest and admit your problems should have blocked you. Your enemies should have busted you. Depression should have broken you and your mistakes should have buried you. Where are the folk who know you ain't been good enough to be here today? Can you take about 10 seconds and thank God for helping you win even when you had a bad hand? Hallelujah. God has always done a lot with a little bit. And the reason why you and I are celebrating today is because when you think about the history of God's people, including you and me, when you think about your life, when you think about the path that God has taken you on, even though it was difficult, you are where you are today because God built you from the bottom up. This is a sermon for the bottom up crowd. This is a sermon for people who have struggled and toiled and prayed and pushed and, and cried and labored to get you where you are today. Everything that God has done in this world, he did it from the bottom up. You think about all the major movements that have occurred in this world, particularly these United States. I'm telling you, whether it be civil rights or voting rights or integration or women's rights and even these United States of America as we know it, everything that God built in us, he did it from the bottom up. Watch me now. When I say from the bottom up, I'm talking about the method 
the means through which God accomplishes his good and perfect will. A lot of times we think that things happen from the top down and that's how, you know, stuff gets built. But you think about a literal building. You start with a blueprint and the first thing you do is lay a foundation. You don't build from the top down. You build from the bottom up. Every movement. And every miracle that has occurred in the life of God's people, he starts from the bottom and then he brings his people up. So with the few moments that have been lent to me this afternoon for the purpose of preaching, we're celebrating our church anniversary. We're celebrating our 84th year of existence. We celebrate all of the outreach efforts that happen here 24 seven. But in order to really appreciate that, you got to understand how the church came to be. Contrary to popular belief, the church is not 10 years old. There's some folk who don't realize Jacob Chapel has such a rich history. We didn't start when I got here. It didn't start with what you see here right now. It didn't start in this building. It didn't start on this land. It did not even start on this street. It did not start in this community. When I talk about the church of Jesus Christ, understand how the church came to be. Jesus said, upon this rock, there go the Bible folk right there. Upon this rock, I will build my church. First person possessive. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock, what rock? Which rock? What is the foundation on which we stand as Christians? You already know the answer. We stand on the truth of who Jesus is. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. You are built on who he is. And we're also built on what he did. Isaiah said he was wounded. For our transgressions. Mm -hmm. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In other words, he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. He served as the middleman, as the mediator between our sin and the wrath of God. Understand that it's only because of who Jesus is and what he did that we can even have a church. Let me put it the way my great granddaddy put it. He died one Friday on a hill called Calvary. They buried him in that borrowed tomb and right early Sunday morning. Y'all was supposed to shout. We would have got out of church at 12 o'clock if y'all had shouted. Now you got 30 more minutes. I said early Sunday morning. He got up with all power in his hand. That's the foundation on which we stand. Everything we are is built on that one truth. Even the church as you know it today. With all the members and all of the ministries and all the outreaches and all the facilities. Understand the church that you see in such great numbers today. The millions if not billions of Christians that are all over this world. Understand the church didn't start with that. The church started with the master and a minority. Again, the master and a minority. You know Jesus had 12 disciples. And by the time Friday passed and then early Sunday morning, he was down to only 11 disciples. So when he gets up from the grave that Sunday morning, this is the announcement that he makes to those faithful few. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And the title of this series is Power with a Purpose. So Jesus said, as a result of the power that I have in my hands, I'm getting ready to now give it to you, and here's what I want you to do. Go. Y'all thought I made up Go Jacob Chapel? It's in the Bible. Jesus says, go ye therefore. Teach all nations. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. You give me 19 more minutes, I'm going to show you how God can do and what God has already done, great things from the bottom up. Jesus says, go into all the world. But they started with just a faithful few. Understand the time and the demographics that you're dealing with. This was a small movement. All they really had was local coverage. All they had was local exposure. Everybody didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't see his sermons on YouTube. Nobody knew that Jesus was even around in the broader community. His name was not declared outside of the city of Jerusalem. This was not a mega church situation that was already built and folk came and joined. No, there had to be effort. There had to be intentionality on the part of the disciples to utilize the power that was given to them by Christ in order to build his church from the bottom up. What is this power for? What is the purpose of our power? These are your three things you can take if you don't get anything else by way of notes. These are the three things that you can get. He gave us power to worship, power to witness, and power to work. These are not three options. Pick one, leave the other two, take a few of them, and then put the other one down. These are three mandates that every child of God must do under the authority of his power. You need to worship, you need to witness, and you need to go to work. Here it is. We worship because of who he is. That's why Sunday mornings are important because when you go through stuff Monday through Saturday, sometimes you need to be reminded of who's in charge. When you start hearing about storms that are hitting places and the only reason that it didn't hit us is by the grace of God. You remember last month when we were praying about our own storm. Now we got to pray for our brothers and sisters in Haiti. Got to pray for our brothers and sisters down there in South Florida. We got to pray for folk that are in Duval and, and up there in Georgia and South Carolina. No, we got to pray for people even up in D.C. and Maryland. Why? Because again, when you see bad news during the week, you got to come back here. So I can remind you of who's in control. When I'm going through my life's trials and my tribulations, I can't wait to get to church on Sunday because I need a reminder. I know who God is, but I need my refill. Have I got a witness here? I know who the Lord is, but worship is that tune-up that helps me deal with them folk on Monday morning. Worship is my refill that helps me to love people even when I don't want to. I'm reminded of who God is and how good he is, how merciful he is how kind he is how loving he is how gracious he is that's why it's a privilege for me to worship where are the worshipers this morning ain't nobody dragged me to church ain't nobody threatened me to come to church ain't nobody guilt tripped me to worship the Lord ain't nobody made me come here this morning no no I woke up this morning with my mind I wish I had a church here with my mind stayed on Jesus I worship Worship him for who he is. Worship is a privilege. But then secondly, his power is what makes me witness. You know how when the old preacher be preaching, he said, can I get a witness up in here? The power of the Holy Spirit ought to cause you to witness who he is. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. All nations are not here in church this morning. That's why you got to go and tell them. What do you teach them? How can I be a witness, pastor? You got to witness to this world about the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, normally when we teach discipleship classes and we teach folk how to go door to door and go share Christ w w within their communities or what have you, usually we tell folk, if you don't have anything else to say about Jesus, just tell folk what he did for you. 
That, that, that's a pretty good way to witness right there. You may not know every scripture. You may not know a whole bunch of Bible verses. But what you can tell them is what he did for you. However, Jesus wants us to understand, even in lieu of all that he's done for you, understand that if you want to lead people to Christ, you cannot tell them what he's done for you until you first tell those folk who he is. You'll understand why in a few seconds. You can't start with bread when you're hungry. That's good church talk, but you can't start there if you're going to witness. You can't start with a lawyer in a courtroom and a doctor in a sick room and a shelter in a time of storm and a bridge over troubled water and water in dry places and a bill payer and the God who will fight your battle. All of those things are true, but if you're going to witness, you cannot start there because the truth that men, women, boys, and girls need to hear is that the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life. Y'all saying that ain't exciting. Huh? Why would you tell somebody that first? Here's why. Because if all you want is fish and bread, that's not Jesus' primary reason for coming into your life. It's almost like them people that want all the benefits of being with you but don't want a commitment with you. Jesus said, why in the world would I give you all my fish and you ain't got no faith in me? Why would I hook you up with all of these benefits but yet you don't want to know me for who I am? If you get sick of them kind of folk in your life, what make you think Jesus wants you coming in here using him like an ATM machine? No, First, you got to know who he is. And if you're going to come after him, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Ask your neighbor what you really want from Jesus. He's making it crystal clear. You can't have his stuff and not have him. You can't have the benefits and none of the responsibility. The kind of witness he wants us to be, yes, it's all right. Tell people what he's done for you. But the reason why those souls got added to the church in the beginning is because they saw themselves as sinners who needed a savior. They saw themselves as sick and they needed a hospital and a doctor. They didn't come for fish and bread. They came because they needed salvation. And so when you get a chance, you can read Acts chapter 2, start somewhere there about verse number 38, and Peter is preaching this sermon. Is right after Pentecost. All of these believers from all over the place were getting together, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, and the Spanish-speaking people were talking to the French-speaking people, and the French-speaking people were talking to the Portuguese people, thus and so. And so when Peter got up to address this crowd, after he got done preaching, verse 38, or rather 37, said that they were pricked in their hearts they got convicted and they said men and brethren what shall we do I'm sick what am I going to do I'm in trouble what am I going to do and Peter said to them in verse 38 repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and so he carried on that way and testified to them, telling them, you got to save yourself from this wicked generation. And verse 41 of Acts chapter 2 says that they gladly received his word. They got baptized. And that same day at the first church service, when Peter opened the doors of the church, we be shouting when we have 30. We be shouting sometime if 50 come on Easter Sunday morning. But at the first church service, 3,000 folk walk down the aisle and they were not drawn to the benefits they were drawn to the savior they didn't join the church because the church had a book bag drive they didn't join the church because the church paid light bills they didn't join the church because they gave senior citizens a meal on saturday originally they joined the church because they knew that jesus was the only way to salvation and the disciples were carrying out the great commission from the bottom up. They didn't have no building. They didn't have no amenities and accoutrements as we do. They didn't have no budget to underwrite what they were doing. All they had was a mandate from Jesus to go 
and to do the work. The problem that I have with this generation of people is that we somehow expect everything to get done from the top down. Y'all be like, go Jacob Chapel. What you really mean is, go Pastor Simmons. I mean, that's what we pay him to do, right? It's his job, so if don't nobody else do nothing, we know he gonna do it. Go, Rev! This is not a top-down operation. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, which means I can't be the only one working. People who have offices and positions and titles can't be the only one working. If you are the member of the body of Christ, this is not a building that we're trying to build. It's a body that we're trying to build. And Jesus is the head. The church is not a place. The church is a people. The church is not an organization. The church is an organism. When I say come join the church, I ain't talking about joining Omega or Alpha or Kappa or Sigma. I ain't talking about joining Delta or AKA or Zeta or Sigma Gamma Rho. No. You join the lodge. You join the golf club. When I say join the body of Christ, I'm talking about becoming a member of a movement somebody ought to help me here a member of a living breathing organism and the only way you have membership is if you agree to be active <sighs> what God wants to do in us and I'm telling you, I'm setting you up for something I'm telling you now I'm setting you up what God wants to do in us he's going to do it from the bottom up He's not going to do it through some governmental bureaucratic entity. He does it through his people. Worshipping, witnessing, and working. Everything that has happened in America, I just told you, in the last 250 years, it happened from the bottom up. You history students can co-sign for this. Understand that America did not come to be because England wanted us to. When we came over here and we were under British rule and we decided that we didn't want to be under British rule anymore, it was those few, those faithful few that were willing to fight and to give their lives in that revolution to say that we want to be independent from any other country and we're going to establish ourselves as a nation. That happened from the bottom The abolishment of slavery was not Abraham Lincoln's idea. I have to teach y'all this because your history books don't mention a whole lot about it. They just say, Lincoln freed the slaves. And y'all believe that. The abolishment of slavery was not Abraham Lincoln's idea. He didn't want to do it, but in order to preserve the union, he felt politically that it was a good idea to go ahead and try to do that, and we still wasn't free even after that. No, it was people like Nat Turner. Y'all need to go to the movies the next weekend now. People like Harriet Tubman, people like Frederick Douglass, and other people like them that were able to work from the bottom up uh, to change the laws, uh, to change the system, and overcome centuries of oppression. When some came through the Underground Railroad, there were others who went back uh, and risked their lives uh, to go get other people. Uh, when they got free in the North, uh, they would creep back to the South and go get more of their brothers and sisters. How did we get free? It was not the government. It was us from the bottom up. Fast forward to the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. How did civil rights come to, to be? It was not JFK's idea. Now, I know your grandmama got a picture of Martin Luther King, you know, JFK, and white Jesus hanging up in her kitchen. But please understand, it was not John F. Kennedy's idea to give us rights. It was not Lyndon Baines Johnson's idea to give us our rights. It was black preachers and their congregations that met in the basement of these AME and Baptist churches that met after the benediction. And they said, we getting ready to march for this. Some of us may die now, but let's go ahead and be prepared to bleed for this thing. If they bust us upside the head, if they sick dogs on us, young people need to help me preach here. Huh? If they do all of that to us, we're willing to do it so our kids can have something, so our grandkids can have freedoms. We got our rights because somebody from the bottom decided to fight. 
And so when you start talking about HBCUs, I need to remind us, fam, you did not start out with 10,000 students and $10 million in the bank. Somebody can testify here. All they had was a faithful few. So when a few of us learned how to read, because it was against the law for us to read, but when a few of us did learn how to read, we would go back and be professors and teachers to others. There was some folk that knew how to do mathematics. So they would come back and teach in the little schoolhouse so that other people could learn. There are folk that knew about masonry and, and agriculture, how to plant some collard greens. Somebody ought to talk back to me here. And they did that because they understood their duty to give back to their community. Maybe the reason why some of our HBCUs are finna die. Maybe the reason why some of us are barely holding on is because we're looking for help from the top down when God said we ought to be doing it from the bottom up. All of y'all that say you bleed orange and green, when the last time you cut a check to orange and green? When the last time you supported something? When the last time you showed up and not just when they trying to get rid of the president. Where are the folk that say you love your university? You got to do more than tailgate on a Saturday. You got to do more than be on the outside of the stadium. When the last time you bought a ticket? When the last time you said, how can I help? Even if it's just a dollar or three, every now and then you got to be willing to do it from the bottom up. I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell nobody I said it. Rick Scott don't love you. Don't, t- don't tell him I said it. I ain't scared of him, but I'll say it to his face. He, he don't love you, and them folk are not concerned about your university. You think I'm talking about white folk? I ain't talking about white folk. I'm talking about people who look just like you uh, that want to see the thing fail. Folk that look just like you and who all they want is power. Them folk don't care about you. They don't care about your education. And we're going to be in danger of losing what we have because we're looking for help from the top down. When you work from the bottom up, you can hold trustees accountable. When you work from the bottom up, you can make teachers show up and actually teach. Somebody ought to help me here. When you work from the bottom up, you won't let these fools sit in your classroom and disrupt everything while you're trying to get your learn on. When you work from the bottom up, you hold your friends accountable. You hold your classmates accountable. And you remind them, we didn't come here to waste time and money. My granddaddy bled for me to go to this school. My ancestors hung on a tree for me to go to this school. How dare you be a thug in college? How dare you sell dope at my university? How dare you be laying up uh, like a bump on a log? Get your lesson and get up out of there. Tell your neighbor from the bottom up. Let me stick with church because that's my area. Me mind my business. I ain't running for nothing. I ain't trying to do nothing. I'm going to just stick with my little church. We got to worship, we got to witness, and we need to work. In 1932, Jacob Chapel was founded by a few saints under what they called a bush harbor. A bush harbor. Y'all know what that is? Me neither. (laughs) That's why I looked it up. Thank God for Google. A bush harbor. (laughs) Google is your friend. I'm trying to help you here. Back in slavery times, back in slavery times, they they, they made arbors. They, they, They set up like these poles, almost out of tree limbs or bamboo. And, and they, 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 they put the poles together and then they covered them with brush or with bush. And that's where you get the bush arbor or bush harbor. It, it, y'all remember like tent revivals? Well, we didn't have no tent back in them days. And so they made use of the resources that they had and they used to hold worship services up under the bush arbor. 1932. I believe that was during the Great Depression. 
when the economy was falling apart, when millionaires were jumping off the top of buildings, killing themselves because they lost everything, when the stock market as they knew it crashed. But yet in the midst of recession, God's folk were building a church. When I tell you Jacob Chapel was a bush harbor, that ought to inspire you today because they did so much more with less. They didn't have 5,000 members. They didn't even have 100 members. They didn't even have 50 members to start out with. But what they did have was a group of people who were determined to see that thing grow and to give God the glory from the bottom up. And the difference between us now and those members 84 years ago is that they all saw each other as being on the same level. See, what has happened now is we have important people The fufu and the fufu, the bougie, and the sophisticated crowd, and we 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 look down on others that don't have what we have and don't come from where we come from. We are the crowd where we can actually have big eyes and little you, so we expect to be treated a certain way. We frown at old church tradition told you last Sunday there's some who want to get rid of devotion because sounds ignorant and the moaning and the lining of the hymns and that's that's not no I prefer praise and worship because we've evolved from all that stuff y'all are doing back in 1932 everybody saw each other as equal because guess what none of us had no rights all of us were oppressed. All of us were disrespected. None of us could vote. All of us were hurting. All of us are struggling. Even if you had a degree from A&M, you were still treated like a second class citizen in America. And so those saints got together and they learned how to feel each other. When one hurt, we all hurt. When one succeeded, we all succeeded. When one celebrated, we all learned how to celebrate because we pulled each other up from the bottom up. That's the miracle of Jacob Chapel's story. Because so many other churches, just like ours, over the last 200 years, those saints were willing to give their all in the service of the Lord. If nobody else was willing to help us, we were willing to help ourselves. I thank God for the church that we are. I thank God for the people that I met when I got here almost 11 years ago. But my fear is that we're raising up a generation that doesn't quite understand how you fit into all this. See, if you're just, I preached a sermon a year ago talking about the core, the core. If, if you're just the curious or the casual member, and you never make it to the core, the active folk that actually keep stuff going around here, you, you're getting all the benefits, but you don't take none of the responsibility. My fear is that all of y'all are piled up in here every Sunday, but God doesn't get any work out of you. You worshiped. You went Facebook Live, so you witnessed. But did you, did you work? What ministry you in? This is the conviction part. Look at me. When do you come here other than a Sunday? For that hour and a half that you give us before you start tipping out early. Try it today. I'm going to call you out. How disrespectful can you be? Do you leave the movie before the end of the movie? I got to teach y'all how to be church. What do you have your hands on? We serve meals every Saturday. We got a clothing closet. We got a food pantry that's open. It could be open every day of the week if we have more volunteers, but I can't wear out the same five people that want to volunteer. Where are the new hands? But then some of you have the nerve to ask, are y'all going to start doing dinner again after church? You gonna help fry some chicken? 
Are you, gonna, are you just going to show up and get three plates and take it to two of your friends that didn't even come to church, but the rest of us are supposed to work so you can have something? What part do you play in all of this? Show me your hand. They didn't have three services on Sunday. Them old folk didn't have a big old sanctuary with lights and padded pews and carpet and air conditioning and hardwood floors and dance ministries and mind ministries and all the other stuff and YouTube and all that other stuff. And that they did more with less. Where are your hands? Oh, you don't have time. Is that it? You're busy. Okay. You're busy. You got stuff to do, right? We you mad at me now because you say, man, you, you don't know my life. You can't be saying what I, what I got. Don't, don't be huffing at me. I ain't scared of you. I'm looking for a crowd that will be more than casual. More, thank you, Holy Ghost, more than curious, but get a part of the core. Do you know what we could do in this community if all of y'all just commit to doing one thing? I ain't asking you to be a choir member and a usher and a dancer. I'm just asking you to find one thing out of the 50 ministries that we have here. Put your hands on something. Otherwise, don't put your behind in the pew. If one person will commit to doing one thing, don't you know the church is run, I don't care if you got 5,000 members, the church is run by them same 100 people that show up to everything, that volunteer for everything, and then the rest of y'all just go around talking about, I love Jacob Chapman. Jacob Chapman, my church, boy, that Pastor Simmons, he be free. Go, Pastor Simmons! What about you? Where are your hands? Where, where are you working? Where does Go Jacob Chapel apply to you? You're not that busy. You're not. The Lord just showed me in the spirit. I, I see your schedule. It just cleared up. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Holla the Bosha. I just saw you in, in the spirit. I just saw it. I just saw it. Your, your, your schedule just cleared up. You go to Panama City when you get ready. I, I, I see some of you in the spirit. I see you. I see you. Some of you right now, I see it. Wait, 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 wait. It's coming to me. I see it. Some of you have already picked out your homecoming outfits. Three weeks in advance. You done already bought clothes or got your eyes on something. Done swiped yourself into debt to get dressed for homecoming. But you say you ain't got no money. Spirit told me. I'm not in your business. I'm just telling you what the Spirit told me. Your schedule just freed up. Your time just opened up. Well, Pastor, I have to work. I, I just, I have, I have so much going on in my life. You, you don't understand my life. Question for you. Who gave you the job? Who, who, who gave you the brain to do the work? Who gave you the motor skills uh, to put your hands uh, to that job? If you can't take a day off of a job, that's a job you don't need to have no more. I say it to you in the name of Jesus. Any job that's holding you hostage and you can't get one day off uh, out of the week, that's slavery, my friend. And I pray you find another job. I pray you have the holy boldness to look them folk in the eye and tell them, look here now, I got to worship my God. Look here, every now and then my church got something going on and they need some volunteers. In fact about it, you need to come over here with me so you can get some Jesus too. Maybe the office wouldn't have so much hell in it if they would have some Jesus. Every now and then, you got to get bold and say without a shadow of a doubt, for God I live and for God I die. He gave me so much, so I got to give him some back. They did so much. In the service of the Lord. And nobody helped them but them. You keep reading in Acts chapter 2. And you'll see where they continued in what they heard on Sunday. Breaking bread and prayers. And they sold all that they had and gave as every man had need. 
Can we get some of them clothes that you got piling up in your house? Can, can you commit between now and next Sunday to go ahead and box that stuff up and bring it down? Somebody will be here to get it, but can you at least bring it? Some of y'all got tags on clothes that you ain't even woe yet. Some of y'all ain't woe stuff in a whole year. Some of y'all done grew four sizes. You can't wear it no more. Bring that to the church. Bring it. Well, I ain't going to get that to the church because I don't want to see my stuff around here on Sunday morning. I don't want to see nobody looking like me on a Sunday morning. Who gave you those clothes? Who blessed you to have more than enough? Some of y'all got three closets in your house. That's a blessing. You don't even need all of that. Can you give something? Can you become a tither? Not because I say so, but because the word says so. Because you say you want your finances to be blessed. You say you want to get your life in order, get your house in order. Well, that starts from you recognizing what God's word says about your money. And rule number one is it ain't your money. God loves a cheerful giver, but you let the minority carry the rest of us. It's a miracle that we do what we do. This church's annual budget is $1.3 million. $1.3 million that comes through here in 12 months' time. It didn't come from some of y'all. I ain't trying to shame you. I ain't going to call the list even though I've seen the list. But imagine how much more we could do if we actually commit to God. You see where the money going? Or do you not see it? You see how the least of these get help. You see how we are in the community, but how can we do those things if only a minority want to get involved? When you walk down this aisle, I'm just about finished. When you walk down this aisle, I don't want you to walk out of emotion. I want you to walk out of commitment. I want you to walk down here because you see that something's going on and you want to be a part of it. You are empowered when you come here. You get your marching orders when you come here. I'm not telling you to come down here eight days out of the week. I'm not asking for 31 days out of your month. All I'm saying is, even when you leave from here, let your light shine out there too. Let somebody know that Jesus is real out there. Treat people right out there because they're not going to listen to no sermon if your lifestyle don't match up with the words. Just love people out there there forgive people out there and then every now and then put your hands to some level of service because that's what we've been called to do that's where we tie in Matthew 25 and I'm done for the day when all of our worship is over when all the singing ends when all the shouting ends even when all the preaching ends at the end of your life at the end of our life you and I are going to stand before God in what those old folk call the judgment. They used to scare you growing up. The judgment. You got to stand before God and answer in the day of judgment. As your pastor, I'm going to be judged separately from you. First, I got to stand before God and answer for whether or not I told you the truth. Did you preach the truth to them? Did you tell them what I said? Did you tell them about sin and a savior? Did you teach them my word and give them the truth of the scriptures? That's one layer of my judgment. Then the next layer of my judgment, I got to stand and answer as a pastor because I had all of this here. I, he, I got to answer to God for what I did with all of this. Did you create opportunities for ministry? Did you not let them settle for just Sunday morning? If you got a bunch of young folk, you got to have young adult ministry. If you got men, you got to have men's ministry. If you got hurting folk, if you sitting right here on the south side of Tallahassee, Simmons, you cannot have all these folk and not get them engaged in their community. Did you do that? That's my judgment. He's not going to judge me by whether or not you listened. That's between you and Jesus. He's not going to judge me based on whether or not you did something. I put it out there. I told the truth. I created the opportunity for you to serve. Whether or not you did it, that's between you and the Lord. 
But here's what is going to happen. Matthew 25 says that when the Son of Man shall come into his glory, all the holy angels will be with him, and he's going to be seated on the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all of the nations. That's all of us, black, white, yellow, brown, everybody, going to stand before that judgment seat, and that's when separation is going to happen. This is your right side. He's going to set the sheep on the right. But that other group, the goats, on the left. I don't know who's who. You don't know who's who. Jesus will make the determination of who was a sheep and who was a goat. And he's going to say to those on his right hand, I'm closing for real now. Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Here's why. Because when I was hungry, I wish I had help to close here. You fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. He says, when I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you had a clothing closet. When I was sick, you came to Miracle Hill and you came to TMH. You came to Big Ben Hospice to visit me. And when I was in prison, you came unto me. But verse 37 of Matthew 25 says that the righteous on that day will answer Jesus. And they're going to ask him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Lord, when did we ever see you thirsty? Uh huh. He's going to say, when did you become a stranger and we took you in? Lord, when did we ever see you naked and gave you clothes? Or when were you sick? When were you in prison? And that's when Jesus is going to answer all of our questions. And he declared that when you've done something to the least of these. He says, you've done it unto me. Which means, simply put, you and I are going to be judged by how we treat the folk at the bottom. You and I are going to be judged not by how we shout it on Sunday, but rather he's going to judge us by how, yeah, we reached out to the community that we serve. Understand that God is not just concerned with the so-called important people, but rather he is concerned with folk that cannot help themselves. And so understand that Jesus is not just concerned about your worship. He wants to know Monday through Saturday, did you work for me? I know why y'all ain't shouting no more. He doesn't want to know if you joined Jacob Chapel. He wants to know, did you join with Jesus and partner in his purpose called ministry? Hmm. You want to know what separates the sheep from the goats is how we serve and how we sacrifice for the least of these. That's what I mean when I say from the bottom up because Jesus has always been concerned with people who find themselves uh, on the bottom. Uh, have I got a witness here? Uh, you and I can argue back and forth uh, about whose lives matter. Uh, we want to say black lives matter. Uh, other folks say blue lives matter. Uh, and other folk counter with all lives matter. Uh, but if people had the Holy Ghost, uh, then we wouldn't mistreat people uh, and make them feel like their life don't matter. Matter. Have I got a witness here? If the government knew God, then they would treat everybody like they matter. If the police knew their purpose, and if they 
had the power of God, uh, then they wouldn't let a criminal go uh, and shoot an innocent person. Uh, have I got a witness here? Uh, if the world uh, had the word of God, uh, then we could build up our community uh, from the bottom up. Uh, but I'll stop by here uh, on my way home today uh, to let somebody in here know uh, that God don't need a majority uh, in order to work a miracle. Uh, it would be nice uh, if I had 5,000 helpers. Uh, it would be nice uh, if all of y'all would show me your hand. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, in between time, uh, I need about two or three people uh, who can help somebody uh, as you pass along. Uh, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody that they're traveling wrong, he said, then my living shall not be in vain. Have I got a witness here? The reason why we ought to reach the least of these. I said, the reason why you ought to reach to the bottom uh, is because that's where Jesus found you uh, when you were lost in your sin. Uh, I wish I had helped you close in. Uh, I couldn't come to Jesus uh, so he came to me. Uh, he reached way down uh, into the pit of hell. Uh, he reached way down uh, into my despair. Uh, I was sinking deep in sin. Uh, I was far uh, from the peaceful shore. Uh, very deeply uh, stained within. Uh, I was sinking uh, to rise no more. Uh, have I got a witness here? Uh, but the master uh, of the sea uh, he heard uh, my despairing cry uh, from the waters uh, he lifted me uh, now safe uh, safe am I uh, turn to your neighbor uh, and tell him your story uh, tell him I'm so glad he started from the bottom, uh, cause that's where I was. Uh, and right early, uh, one Friday morning, uh, he came down uh, through 42 generations, uh, stretched him wide, uh, and they hung him high. Uh, he died. Uh, didn't he die? Uh, this where church folk ought to get happy. Uh, I said he died uh, for your sin and mine. Uh, lay Jesus uh, in a borrowed tomb. Uh, stay there uh, all day Friday uh, and all Friday nights. Uh, stay there uh, all day Saturday uh, and all Saturday night. Uh, but brighter. Get happy, y'all. I said, hey, Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I'm so glad. Said I'm so glad. I said I'm so glad. I got a savior who reached way down and he picked me up. Shake your neighbor's hand. We gotta get out of here. Find you a good neighbor who ain't acting funny. Find you a good neighbor that ain't mad at the preacher. Find you a good neighbor that know him like you know him. And tell them, neighbor, I don't look like what I've been through. Tell them I started from the bottom. 
but now I'm here. I started out raggedy, but now I'm here. I had tears in my eyes, but now I'm here. I had a record, but now I'm here. I went to jail, but now I'm here. I used to get high. But now I'm here. I used to stumble drunk. But now I'm here. If the Lord been good to you, help me lift him up. If the Lord made a way for you, help me praise his name. If the Lord opened doors for you, shake somebody's hand and tell him I owe him. My praise, I owe him. My worship, I owe him. All the glory, he the worthy. Yes, yes, worthy, worthy. I feel my second win now. Is there anybody here ready to serve the Lord? Don't fool me now. Can you give God a little time? Can you do a little more than you've been doing? Can you give just a little more? Can you praise him just a little more? Don't let him shout by himself. Don't let me preach by myself. If you know him like I know him. If you tried him like I tried him. Preach it like I'm preaching it. Say it like I'm saying it. Uh, tell somebody, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Uh, say it like I'm saying it. Uh, preach it like I'm preaching it. Uh, tell your neighbor, uh, I don't need 500 people uh, to worship God uh, on my behalf. Uh, I'll pray them. Uh, if I gotta do it by myself, I'll shout. If I gotta do it by myself, so one more time, reach up and get it. Go get your holler. Yeah! 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 Hallelujah. I got to do this again. Hallelujah. Where are the people that started from the bottom? Where are the folk that God pulled out of the bottom? Tell somebody, I'm not supposed to be here, but he pulled me from the bottom. I, I should have been dead. <laughs> sleeping in my grave uh, but I started from the bottom uh, now I'm here uh, he pulled me out of the muck and the mire uh, and now I'm here uh, turn to one more neighbor uh, y'all so tired of me uh, turn to one more neighbor uh, give him your testimony uh, and tell him neighbor if you knew me uh, 10 years ago You'd understand why I turn up in church if you knew the hell I've been through. You'd understand why I gotta holler. He brought me from a mighty long way. He kept me when I didn't want to be kept. Do you know him? in the amen corner uh, have you tried him uh, in the thank you jesus section uh, and he all right uh-huh and he all right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. doors open
If he's going to do it. If he's going to do it. He going to do it from the bottom up. Don't you worry about folk that call you. All them bottom names. Oh, you country, you hood, you ghetto, you gutter. Good stuff come out the gutter. Oh, yeah.